We're still moving through the Kingdom series here, and we moved out of the Gospels. We've, we've now finished up everything that Jesus, through the Gospels and Acts, that he wants to teach us about the Kingdom of God and reflected on those things and tried to learn what we could. Now we're going to start to see the Kingdom of God as it's expressed through the apostles and the followers of Jesus and the disciples and we're going to start to learn from those stories, and they won't be nearly as direct or as plentiful, but there's going to be plenty plenty to learn. And this story today, um, I debated how to even teach this, because this is a story, I don't think we're trying to avoid this story, it's just not a story we talk about very much, because it's kind of odd and it's weird. It has a passing reference to the kingdom, and I think some would even argue that the story itself is is really not tied directly to a Kingdom of God reference? Is there anything to learn about the Kingdom in this reference? Um, and, and it could be kind of indirect, and it might even be a stretch on some level for me to draw a connection. But I, I do think there's a lesson here, and I do think there's a connection, and I do think I want to draw it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite us to do that. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 8 is where this Kingdom reference shows up. I'm going to start reading in 8 verse 9. It's the story of Simon the Sorcerer. So not Simon Peter, but another, a new Simon that we learn about here. Verse 9, Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. Which they probably don't mean with any twinkle in their eye, but that... There is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to get sidetracked here, the discussion about the power, the power that sits at the right hand of God is an expression that showed up, that shows up in different translations of Daniel and the Psalms, and, and what could that potentially, what's the connection between the power, the power of God, um, so it's interesting that they call him that, they probably just call him that because he's a powerful sorcerer who does great works. They followed him, this group of people follow Simon the sorcerer, because he, has ama he had amazed them for a long time uh, with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news, there's the euangelion, as he proclaimed the euangelion of the kingdom of God, so, so Philip comes through, and he's doing what Jesus told him to do, and he's doing what Jesus did. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. There's a new king and a new kingdom. Philip comes through proclaiming a new king and a new kingdom. What's the essence of his gospel? The kingdom of God. So this is very consistent with everything we've learned in this series. And now they're picking up the post-resurrection, post-Pentecost mantle, and they're still preaching the same message, the same methods, the same kingdom conversation that was central to Jesus is apparently central to the apostles as well. So he, he, was, he came through proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. So Philip is a sorcerer. He has this great following, which I, I kind of love this story in light of the social media world that we live in today. Um, you know, he's like a YouTube influencer. He's a sorcerer, and he's built a platform, and he's got, he's got a bunch of followers. And I don't say that in a disparaging way. I, I, I'm a person that has tried to figure out how to steward a platform. I don't know if I went out to build a platform. I haven't tried to grow a platform, but I now have this podcast and I create digital content. And I know what it I know what it is to have a platform and to have a following and to have people that that and and so Philip comes through proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God and and Simon's followers swear a new allegiance to a new king and a new kingdom, which is beautiful and even more beautiful. If I can take this, I, I believe this passage tells me about a genuine, authentic conversion. Not only do his followers change their allegiance, Simon changes his allegiance. And that takes some level, 
some level of humility when you're somebody who has a platform, a following, when you're a, a great sorcerer who has a, a, a nickname of being the great power of God, and, and yet you swear, you, you bend the knee, you swear a new allegiance to a new king? That's actually a really impressive verse. But then there's this other verse, and it says, but he was amazed at what he saw. And I don't think that makes his conversion disingenuous. I don't think it means that he had ulterior selfish motives. I think it means that he brought his full self into this experience. And not only was it authentic and genuine, but he also brought his personality, his past experiences, his giftedness, um, he brought, he brought himself in all of its good and its ugly. And by the way, that's how it always works with all of us. For any of us that have given our lives to the gospel or the kingdom of God, or the gospel of the kingdom of God, any, any of us that have sworn our allegiance to a new king and a new kingdom, King Jesus, we have brought with us things that are beautiful, that are a part of us, and we have brought with us things that God probably wants to shape or do away with. And then we bring with us things that God probably wants to redeem. Like, I don't think God wants to get rid of all the things that made Simon the sorcerer Simon the sorcerer. I think God wants to redeem some of the things that made Simon who he was. Some things that, there are some things that God does want to do away with. Let's just toss those things in the trash. But then there are some things that God's like, actually, if I can take that and shape it and mold it and change it to be a part of my kingdom, that's a beautiful thing. How about you bring that with you? I think I think I see that with Simon. It's going to have some danger as well, we're going to see. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, I think we read over that too quickly. Catch that. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, of all the places, Samaria, you remember the Samaritans. You remember how Jews feel about Samaritans, how Jerusalem feels about Samaria. But they heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit, which I know raises a whole bunch of questions for me. I'm sure that paragraph probably raises questions for you. So, so they were baptized and, and swore their allegiance to Jesus, but didn't receive the Holy Spirit. And so, and so the church in Jerusalem, I mean, Philip's an apostle. It's not like they had to send apostles. They already had an apostle there. Philip was already there proclaiming the euangelion. But they had to, they had to send Peter and John to be with Philip. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily understand why. I don't think I would make too much of the mechanics of that. But I do wonder if on some level this movement of God needed to not only be heralded, but like witnessed and uh, like... We needed more than just Philip to be there. Because I wonder if Philip would have said the Samaritans believe, if people had been like, that's great. And then I wonder if they would have held the Samaritans at arm's length. But instead, Peter and John show up so that there has to be like this acknowledgement, this buy-in, like we're, we are here. This inclusive moment with the Samaritans. We're here affirming and confirming this inclusion of Samaritans into the fold of believers. But then the story continues. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So Simon's now like, Holy smokes, what was that? Like they just came and laid on hands and they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon, the former sorcerer, is like, I want to get in on that. What, what's, what's happening here? Simon, some of these things that Simon's bringing with him, some of the things that the old Simon um, experienced and, and was comfortable with and knew and was familiar with, he, some of that same like sorcery-esque 
He's like, I, I want to get in on that. This resonates with me. This is what I'm all about. Guys, how can I purchase this? And Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So, I mean, Peter doesn't cut... I mean, he doesn't cut any corners here. Like, Peter's pretty straightforward and pretty pretty blunt about all of this. And, and, and I, I think that the scripture told me earlier that Simon's conversion was genuine, and yet there are still, there are still some things he's getting over. And Peter's words, he's still captive to sin. And these thoughts are in his heart. And what was the other phrase that he used? Your heart is not right before God. There's still, and I don't know if it was right. And now he started, is he starting to go backwards? But, but listen to this. Then Simon answered, not Simon Peter, Simon the sorcerer. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And I... I think, again, I hear genuine, that sounds to me like, I'm not told any different. It sounds to me like a genuine prayer of repentance. That Simon the sorcerer hears that rebuke from Peter and says, oh, no, no, you're, you're, you're right. And then this story closes with a couple of verses. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John refer, re, returned to Jerusalem, preaching the euangelion, I'm sure, of the kingdom of God in many Samaritan villages. So what does this story have to teach us? Again, it might be a little indirect, but what can we learn about the kingdom of God from this story? I, 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 think, I, I think I would make three reflections. Number one, the kingdom of God has everything to say and brings everything to bear on our material reality, our material possessions, our material wealth. The kingdom of God is relevant to, to everything, including our material wealth. But the kingdom of God is not subject to our material wealth. Like, like the kingdom of God does not bow its knee to our materiality. Our materiality, if it's held properly, bows the knee to the kingdom. And, and I think most of us hear that and we're like, yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, no big deal. And as I was getting ready for this video, I was like, man, I think I'm convicted about that as, a, as an American Westerner, as a Western American Christian. I think I assume that my material reality bears more on the kingdom of God than I realize. Like, I think the kingdom of God is possible because of what I do materially, because of the things I'm able to spend materially, or the way that I give my material wealth. I, I, I think actually I may get this backwards way more than I realize. The kingdom of God operates far outside of that. Uh, what, what's the last stanza to the Lord's Prayer? If you if you look at maybe some of the later manuscripts, there's that stanza at the very end. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Yours is the kingdom, forever and ever. Amen. That's how the Lord's Prayer ends. I mean that that's an assertion that it's God's power. It's God's kingdom. It's God's glory. It's not ours. That the kingdom. It's not. It's not our power. It's not our material wealth. It's not our glory. It's not our kingdom. It's not our name. It's God's name. Everything is in reference to God's kingdom. There's nothing that we do that brings the kingdom underneath. Can't purchase that. You can't steer that with material wealth or investment. I think there might be more to learn about the kingdom of God there than we might think on the surface. But then the second thing would be this. Um, I love... I love Simon the Sorcerer's response. Like, like we can't, 
we can still, second reflection, we need to be careful about the things that we bring with us to the kingdom and into the kingdom as the kingdom of God begins to change our lives. Because we still bring all of our old selves with us into the kingdom. And, and that's a part of it because all of our old selves aren't what needs to be rejected. Jesus will begin, the, like sometimes we talk about the work of sanctification. Jesus will do the work of getting rid of the stuff that doesn't belong. It doesn't happen instantly. And I think part of the reason why God doesn't just make it happen instantly is because there are parts of that old self that he is redeeming. There are parts that he does want to shape and mold and keep in us because he wants to redeem those parts and use it for his name, his kingdom, his power, his glory. But then there are other things that Jesus is, you know, cutting away, shaving away, getting rid of, doing away with, and that's all a process. And I think being aware of that process, because sometimes as Simon learned that day, Simon the sorcerer learned from Peter that day, that can be a very dangerous thing, some of the things that we bring with us and think like, oh yeah, I know all about this. I'm just going to use, whoa, 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 that, that is not the kingdom of God. So to be, to be aware of that. But third, what I love about what I feel like I learned from Simon, I see it twice in this story, the humility to say yes to Jesus and give up his platform give up his influence, give up number one chair to swear a new allegiance to a new kingdom. But then I see it show up again when he's rebuked and I hear Simon say, oh goodness, you're right. Like he has this over the top personality. He has this trigger happy, I want to go, I want to do, I want to... He, he has this same thing about him. But he also has the humility to respond appropriately when he needs to. It appears to me. I could be wrong. But as I read this passage, I think I see a Simon who's willing willing to be rebuked and say, no, I, no, I don't want my heart to be in the, in the wrong place. But you're right. You're right. I think it is. So, so I do repent and I do pray and I'm asking you to pray for me. I... I I don't want my heart to be in the wrong place. I don't want to be motivated by the wrong things. Help me walk in the kingdom appropriately. Anyway, I think there are some things there. It may be an indirect teaching on the kingdom of God, a passing reference in Acts chapter 8, but I felt like there were some things in that story that that I felt like were, were really meaningful reflections for me and therefore, I, I share it with you. So I look forward to the next conversation in the Kingdom series. Um, wherever Acts goes next, I don't know where it goes. It might even be, it might even be Acts chapter nine, the very next chapter where we start to bump into the Kingdom of God yet again in the story of Acts. So we'll see, and we'll talk to you in the next video.